Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Keith Strain, and uh, I am the retired pastor of this church, and have the honor of being asked by Pastor Darla, who's on vacation, if I would fill in for her. She had to beg me a whole lot to do that. Uh, now, you know better than that. I love being here, and I love uh, having the opportunity to preach for you today. Uh, part of what's going on is a continuing evolution of trying to figure out how to worship in the midst of a pandemic. And uh, we have been remarkably creative of that. And moving from when you watch Darla in her study at home uh, to where we are now partially back in the service. And so uh, my appreciation to all who are helping to lead this service, as today we added new things of what happens here to try to uh, help that sense of, of this being different than just watching at home. And, uh, there were a lot of communications back and forth. And I want to express appreciation to those who are helping us today, to Arlene, who faithfully distributes communion for us as we come in, to Dale for taking care of all of this electronic tech that makes all of this possible, uh, to Carter, uh, who is minding the sound, uh, Sandy on the keyboard, uh, to Bonnie and Brad, who will be at the table, Nicholas, who's doing the scripture, uh, Betsy, who's giving the morning prayer, to Andrew for leading our liturgy, and to Joe and Christy for setting our table. Uh, announcements about events in the life of the church and the concerns list that we try to keep within our hearts and minds are all in your newsletter, and we always ask you to keep those in mind. With all of that said, let's take a moment to take a deep breath and to tune our hearts and our minds to this time. If you would, please join with the call to worship in unison. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. But we are still on the way, some in this sanctuary to worship, others still sheltering at home. Still we come to this time, turning our attention to God, longing for a time when we all be gathered as one to worship. As we go to God in prayer this morning, remember those listed in our prayer concerns in the newsletter. I also ask you to keep Pastor Darla and Pastor Kevin in your prayers during this difficult time. Before our spoken prayer, we will take some time, quiet time, for you to lift your own concerns before God. Merciful and loving God, listen to your children praying.
God of these days of pandemic and isolation and anxiety. So much has happened in these past few months, these last few weeks, these last few hours, a kind of whirlwind of change. We've known death and birth. We've been brave and scared. We've been hurt and we've helped. We've been socially distant with people and we have been lonely. We have laughed and we have cried. And now it's time to look to a new day, a new chapter. Help us as a community of faith to believe in new beginnings. For all who have contracted coronavirus, we pray for care and healing. For those who are particularly vulnerable, we pray for safety and protection. For all who experience fear or anxiety, we pray for peace of mind and spirit. For affected families who are facing difficult decisions between food on the table or safety at work or school, we pray for policies that recognize their plight. And for those who do not have adequate health insurance, we pray that no family will face financial burdens alone. And we pray for public officials and decision makers from the White House to our Montgomery County Courthouse. O oh, loving God, your grace is sufficient in every need, in every place, in every time. Your power has seen each of us in our beloved congregation through challenging circumstances in the past. Be with us now and in the days ahead as we pray for wisdom and guidance. And may our church be a sign of hope, comfort, and love for all. We offer this prayer in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I remember being at some church event, and there was one of those speakers that was supposed to fire us up. And he started by saying, there are two things that you can look at to find out where your priorities are. They are your calendar and your checkbook. Think about that. Where we spend our time and where we spend our money is really what is it we're all about. I think that's one of the reasons why as a part of our worship, we take up an offering so that we can remind ourselves of our priority in supporting God's work through this church as a part of our own faith, as well as supporting the church. And so we give an opportunity to, to share with the Lord in the work that is being done through this church. Please join me as we give dedication over the offering. For all the ways we are blessed, gracious God, we thank you. For all the blessings you give us to use in your name, generous God, we thank you. For the gifts given to support the work of this church, our spiritual home, we give thanks for generous believers who bless God's work in and through this place. Amen. First reading today is from Matthew 13:13 13, 13 through 16. The reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, you will indeed listen but never understand and you will indeed look but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes so that they might not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, 
and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. The second reading is from Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Soon afterwards, he went on through villages and cities, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward Shusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their own resources. Will you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The first scripture read by Nicholas sets our topic for today. Is anybody listening? You'll recall that Jesus, speaking about the audience of those who were hearing his parables, gives a dire conclusion about his words having any effect. He quotes the prophet Isaiah saying, you shall indeed hear, but never understand. You shall indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull and their ears are hard of hearing. In its context, Jesus is telling his disciples, that's who he's speaking to in this passage, that the crowds that flock to hear him are in effect wasting their time. Why? Because they will not hear. Now, if you've ever been in a relationship, I am certain that at one point or the other, your partner said something to the effect, you're not listening to me. And if you were wise, you put aside everything with which your mind was distracted and listened. In the five months of the pandemic, I have had a lot of time to mull. A mull is a word that means to ponder, but it's from an old English word that means to grind down. So here's what's been grinding away at me for all these months. When and why did we stop listening to each other? I assume that this is somewhat obvious, but I will state it anyway. We live in a society that is almost totally polarized. It's not that we have varieties of opinions or thoughts and positions. Rather, we stand at opposites from one another. We love or we hate Donald Trump. We are pro-life or pro-choice. We are for mail-in ballots or this idea will destroy democracy. We are for opening up or for shutting down. Everyone should wear a mask or masks are useless and a violation of my God-given, divinely inspired constitutional rights. Let me try one that's not so political. Toilet paper should come off the top of the roll or Toilet paper should only come off the bottom of the roll. It's not that we're divided into camps of differing positions. It's as if we have locked ourselves into fortresses of closed minds. And nobody's listening. Well, there's a reason for that. We have learned from experience that it's not even worth the breath. Why bother even talking to the other side? They're not going to listen. Are you trapping with me? As the text from Matthew suggests, Jesus attempted to bring the good news of God's loving grace to a people who had their minds made up. And in their case, it was their understanding of the nature of God. And it was a sense of God that God was the God of Israel, his chosen people. Salvation was only for the Jews, but only those Jews that obeyed the law of Moses. The non-Jews, the Gentiles, were lost and beyond hope, and therefore, why even bother? 
The idea of a, of a seeking God, of a God who sought the lost in their sin, of a God who saw hope and value in those that the good people ignored and discounted, of a God who called people to embrace a new understanding of the very nature of God, from one who judged, especially in dishing out punishments on all those who are not good and holy like, well, you and me, to a God who is like a loving parent who just will not give up even on the most rebellious child. Of a God who is less concerned about the color of the liturgical season and correctly using the word sins rather than trespasses and that the only holy music is that which is played on the organ. To a God who sought to restore the brokenness that is within every person and among us. That idea of God did not compute. It was different, it was novel, it was new, and therefore rejected. Only that's really not fair. The God that Jesus presented was not totally novel. There are hints of a loving God in the Old Testament, Hosea being the prime example, with the parable of Jonah not too far behind. It was not just that Jesus called, well, demanded that people embrace a new understanding of God. What made them reject his teachings and him was that he demanded of them change. Now think of us today, some sheltering at home in, uh, uh, in place or those of us daring to come out and worship with wearing masks and socially distanced and anointed with hand sanitizers. Why aren't we listening? We're not listening to each other because they won't listen. And if they won't listen, why should I bother to listen? And they won't listen because if they did listen, they would be so eloquently moved by my position that they would have to embrace it and change. Somewhere along the line, the notion that God has stopped speaking snuck in the back door. I suspect we can blame it on those who felt the authority of the Bible was under attack and created the notion of biblical inerrancy. That is, that the Bible is the absolute word of God. Not only is every word true, but each word came directly from God, and everything that needs to be said has been said, period. God has spoken, and anything you need to know about God, it's in the book. That's not what the Bible says about God. The prophet Isaiah, again to refer to the same source, some 400 years before Jesus had heard God say to him that he should, as a prophet, go and preach to the people and that the people would not listen, but to do it anyway. He did, they didn't, and they ended up in captivity in Babylon. Jesus came along and said the people at large would listen, but not hear. That is, they will hear the sermon, but they will not respond to the altar call. But you know that some did. Some did, and because they did, the world changed, and because of that, we are here today. Back when the battle lines over abortion and gay rights were being drawn, one side was hauling out the Bible passages to buttress their arguments. And in the midst of that, the United Church of Christ came out with a new motto. Our God is still speaking. I resonate deeply with that idea. Is, is your God alive? Is your God still active in this universe we occupy? If so, should we then not also ask, what is God saying to us now? With that in mind, I want to take us now to our second scripture, that from the Gospel of Luke. It reads kind of like a footnote, something that the writer added because he got to that point in his text and he realized that he had not listed all the people involved because he had left totally out all the people who took care of the needs of Jesus and the Twelve from day to day. And why might we have thought that was a footnote? Because it's housekeeping and that's a woman's job. At first glance, 
This can be dismissed as just that, housekeeping. But just like the average husband today about housekeeping, we only notice it when it isn't done, because what do we assume today? It's women's work. Only we live in a time when if a husband says that out loud, he must at the same time be ducking and covering. Well, I have told you before that I grew up in a misogynistic church. I didn't know that term then, and I still can't spell it. But I did understand the reality of what it meant. The church of our origin was First Christian Church in Lubbock, Texas. And just in case you don't know, and I have told you before, Texas is the state with the largest number of disciples in all of the Union. And out on the far West Texas Plains is located Lubbock. Both my father and his predecessor served terms as presidents of the disciples in Texas. It was at one point in my high school, I think about the year 1960, I saw a copy of the Constitution of the Church. It listed a board that had 59 people. They had cut it down some, of which there were four women, the president of the Christian Women's Fellowship, the chairman of children's education, and two deaconesses who had but one job that was spelled out in the sentence, shall cl clean the communion ware after every use. There were no women deacons, no women elders, and God forbid you even bring up the subject of women ministers. Well, that was the structure of the church. It was not the experience of my religious journey in that church. That journey, that growth of my faith and understanding was primarily at the hands and at the efforts of women. They were the ones who had taught me as a child. They were the ones who demonstrated what it meant to be loved as a child of God. They were, in fact, the hands and the hearts of the faith. So when some of these women began to stay up, stand up and say, enough is enough, we're tired of sitting in the back of the bus, uh, I'm sorry, I, we're tired of being the kitchen crew, I resonated with their feelings that the faith I knew and understood was that which had been nourished and given practical implication more by women than the men. Now look at us today. There are women at the table. There are women leading in worship. We have a woman pastor, and the leader of our national church is both a woman and a woman of color. Yet if you open the scriptures, the texts are still there. Let women keep silent in church. The husband is the head of the family. Let women keep their heads covered, lest they distract the angels. What changed? Well, in the case of the last one, hats. Fashions changed. But in the rest of it, what happened is that people realized that reading the specific lines that Paul wrote to one church that was in the midst of immense difficulties might need closer examination. The church, considering the role of women, listened to the Spirit of God as made known to them by Jesus, and they chose the value of a person's gifts over their gender. They might well have pulled out this text from Luke 8, where three women are exalted for the ways that they gave of themselves to make the work of Jesus possible. And if the church had noticed this text, they might also have wondered, why did Luke stick it there? What difference did it make at that point? Why is it they aren't mentioned elsewhere in the scripture? Maybe because the writer of Luke was the Luke mentioned as the companion of Paul. And that Luke noted how many times Paul mentioned women by name referring to them as sisters, as saints, as partners in the work of the kingdom. Luke was a revolutionary. His interpretation of the gospel presents the coming of Christ into this world as that event that's going to change everything, as an event that's going to completely reverse all the norms and expectations. If you're looking for a manifesto for social action, Luke is your book. From the very beginning, the words of Mary, known as the Magnificat, Magnificat, Luke paints a vision of a world where all the assumptions of rank and privilege, of status and standing, 
the whole idea of power was going to be completely reversed. When the Son of God is born, it's in a stable, not a palace. His attendants were whatever animals were in that shelter. He is visited not by VIPs, nor the celebrities, nor powerful, not even by the local religious leaders, but by, of all people, shepherds. The story goes on when this baby becomes a man and begins his ministry, choosing to spend his time with those that society had dismissed as being unworthy of or of no import. This was so true that he was accused of being the one who spent all of his time with Gentiles and sinners. He was put to death because he was a clear threat to organized religion, and they would have nothing to do with him or with his idea of God. In the midst of Luke's story is this so totally overlooked account of women who supported the work of Jesus and the Twelve. In the beginning, the church was a place where people found a whole new way of understanding and regarding each other. A way that started with a radical point of view, and that is that we are all children of God, equally regarded, equally loved, equally graced, and Luke would probably add, equally gifted. Then somewhere in time, the church stopped listening and forgot. And almost 2,000 years passed before the church began to hear again. And here we are today. As William Barclay put it in his commentary on this text, it is one of the supreme achievements of Jesus that he can enable the most diverse people to live together. Barclay goes on to share that not only does this gospel living as portrayed in Luke allow very different people to live and work together, but that this shared calling and identity does not mean that they all become the same. Rather, he says, Jesus calls us together, diverse as we are, and challenges us that within the wonder and glory of God's love and grace for us, that we will look past how different we are and embrace the one reality that truly matters. And that is that in the eyes of God, we are all God's beloved children. Listening to Christ, we might just learn how to see each other as being unique and see such differences not as threats, but rather as a gift of God that allows us, perhaps even forces us to look at alternatives to confront different ideas and means, to open us up to the possibility that perhaps there just might be a different way of doing things, a different way of understanding things. That is not only equally valid, but that which might even open us to a deeper, richer, fuller relationship with God and hence with one another. And if that could happen, if that could happen here as it happened in the early church, then we too would have a hint of what heaven is like. It is my prayer, my fervent prayer for this congregation, that we will start listening again, that we will open our hearts and minds to hear what God is saying to us. And if we do, we will discover the richness that makes up this quilt-like community, and we will discover how rich is this community which God has called together. And when that happens, then we will rejoice at every opportunity we have to say with the psalmist, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord.
disciple of Christ, one of the things that it is just has to be a part of worship is partaking of communion. And yet, we are not doing what communion means. Communion means to be one. It is a communal act. Uh, you remember, there once was a time in the church where we passed the trays to one another, and so we lived out the idea that as we are served by the deacons, we then in turn serve each other, and thus the partaking becomes an act of the whole community. Uh, now we're reduced to sanitary individual cups of partaking. So as a way to regain a hint of that communal nature of communion, we are going today to take the bread and then the cup, and we'll do so in unison. So I encourage you to bend back the top part and get your bread loose, and then after the prayer and the words of institution, we'll partake of the bread, and then after the words of institution for the cup, we'll share in the cup. And maybe it's just a small thing, but may it help us move closer to that time we can once again be together as a community. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, please join me in prayer. Most holy God, we invite you to inhibit our hearts, inhabit our hearts and minds as we participate in communion. Each time we partake, we stand beside the empty cross and are reminded of your limitless love and forgiveness through Christ's sacrifice. Please bless these symbols and bind us together as one family filled with your grace, truth, peace, and joy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now from Corinthians, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this, this is, is my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also the cup, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We thank you, God for your presence and your purpose, for your loving kindness and your steadfast spirit. May the blessings of this table strengthen our faith, increase our generosity, and unify our hearts, no matter if we are able to be here in person or watching from home. In the name of Jesus, amen. It was indeed a delight to share this time of worship together, whether you're watching at home or whether you are here with us today. It is always good when we can begin together in God's name. Uh, we're going to be leaving uh, from this place uh, with Mass John to go outside. I encourage you to take time to greet uh, one another. For those of you at home, we look forward to that day when we can all be here together. I invite you now to join with me in uh, the closing prayer. Send us forth, O God, renewed and refreshed by this time together with you. Bless us in the journey of the week to come. May each minute of each day reflect your love in all we are and do. And Lord, hasten the day when we can all be here to worship you.